Hello, World Wide Web. I'm Becker Shadow, the internet personality with the best hair. I knew, even before starting, THE SUMMER OF STEVEN SEGAL! <laughs> that there were parallels between his work and the work of another man who I have already covered quite extensively, Jean-Claude Van Damme. They are both action stars from the end of the 80s. Throughout the 90s, they are both prominently martial artists first and actors second. And while they still have movies to this day, they have made some real stinkers. There's another thing they have in common, though, as it turns out both of them have taken a stab at the director's seat. We may have expected this from Seagal, as he produces most of his films himself anyway, and writes a good amount of them to boot, but truth be told, Van Damme has directed twice as many movies as Seagal. Two instead of one! Though Seagal did take the role two years earlier than Van Damme in the action-packed, explosion-laden, burning buildings to the ground, environmental awareness film on Deadly Ground. Because what better way is there to bring light to the terrible ways the oil companies murder our precious planet Earth than watching Seagal set fire to every set, pumping black smoke into the atmosphere, and have said oil companies depicted in the most evil, hateful way possible? I guess he could have tried something with believable characters and actually based it on true events, but never mind that. Let's take a look at On Deadly Ground and see Seagal um, trying to profess his moral and ethical... superiority? After the opening credits establish, we're in Alaska with beautiful snowy mountains and majestic polar bears that... Aww, it's so... HOLY SHIT, THAT OIL RIG IS ON FIRE! And that's not stock footage. Don't worry, though, it's all in the name of environmental awareness. Suddenly, the movie changes into 4x3 ratio. Well, okay, it was always in 4x3, it just had huge letterboxes earlier. Turns out that several shots in this movie look a lot better in widescreen, so instead of releasing a widescreen DVD, they just released a full screen one and have several shots go back and forth between full screen and widescreen. Anyway, this helicopter is carrying Steven Seagal, playing the role of Forrest Taft. You're totally out of control. I got four guys down. And all because your goddamn pal Jennings lousy. Your goddamn pal Jennings lousy what? Michael Caine? What the fuck are you doing here? Oh, well, that's just great. Now I'm never going to be able to watch the Nolan Batman movies without thinking of the fact that you were in a Seagal film. Anyway, Michael Caine plays Michael Jennings, CEO of Aegis Oil, while Seagal is, um, a guy. He works for Aegis Oil, but he doesn't have a job that exists in reality. He's kind of an emergency responder, except of course he works alone. After all, who needs more than one man to set something up this sophisticated? Anyone who's played Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 knows why that worked. And it's a good thing, too, because this movie doesn't explain that. No, no, that's a good thing, too. I mean, if they did, they'd probably get it wrong. As they leave, they establish that Jennings doesn't believe the foreman's word for a second that there were faulty preventers, and it must be the foreman's fault instead. My oil is flowing all over the ocean instead of into my refinery where it's worth money to me. I'll have Eskimos and environmentalists probing all the orifices of my body for the next two weeks. Now why the hell would I do that to myself on purpose? You know what's really great about that question? He has a point. Even according to the plot, he'd be a lot better off if that rig were intact. Enough of Kane, though. No, no reason to build any more character into him. No, it's time for us to see Seagal at the bar where surly drunkard Mike Starr just so happens to be causing a ruckus. Listen to me, you yellow snow-eating, <laughs> welfare-collecting, redskin piece of shit. I, Get the fuck I, out of here! <laughs> Hmm. Oh, you think his character might be, I don't know, racist? Before we can move on to his eventual ass-kicking, though, the foreman comes by, Hugh Palmer, played by Richard Hamilton, who you may remember as D from Men in Black. Check out the requisition file on Ages 1. Go ahead. I got it to You got the clearance. I can't get in there, but you can. Okay, so he has security clearance. Uh, does that rank him higher than emergency responder, or is it completely unrelated? Now that he's told Seagal how to do his job, that he should know what it entails anyway, he leaves and now it's time for surly racist asshole to be a surly racist asshole yet again. And Seagal gets to establish that he somehow knows how to fight! Not only that, but surprisingly enough, he just so happens to be the best ever at it, capable of fighting an entire bar worth of racist dick's friends without suffering a single injury! Hey, 
great, buddy. Don't be fucking with oil workers, huh? <laughs> Of course, it doesn't hurt that he just so happens to be kicking geriatric ass. Now it's time to get racist asshole and make sure he pays for all the horrible things that... The hand slap game. One man leaves the circle. I miss, you get a shot. You miss, I get a shot. Your big confrontation in this scene is... a game of slaps? This might surprise you, but Seagal also happens to be the reigning world champion at slaps! After beating the shit out of him, that somehow leads to this. What does it take to change the essence of a man? I need time to change. How touching. What the fuck was that? It didn't look like it took time to me, it looked like it took breaking his nose. Thank you, my brother. We're about to go on a sacred journey. This journey will be good for all people. This was revealed to me by my spirit guides. The frogs of Budweiser. Now we've got to hurry and develop some character for Jennings, though, so what better way than a PR commercial? You have any great ideas? Just keep them to your fucking self, okay? And leave this shit to me. No. Fun fact! That's Irvin Kirshner! the director of The Empire Strikes Back. This hilarious scene shows him loving all things about nature when it turns out he doesn't like nature at all. Who cares? We do. At H.S. Oil. Cut! Fuck these animals stink. Bring me a washcloth. Shit, we're only 20 minutes in and if it gets any more cartoony, it... I, I don't even want to say. How long do they say now? 21 days. God damn it, we had 13 days! 13! Hold on there, Kane. You're getting really close. Get out! Sir, I'm not... I don't give a shit! Now let me explain. You look 10 years younger. Get out! If you'll just calm down before... And we lose all our rights. Worth billions of dollars a week. Now, the first order of business is to put all this oil back where it came from. Damn it, Michael! Now look what you've done! We then go to the rig Aegis-1, which looks like it exists somewhere on N64, where Seagal sneaks into the control room that he has access codes to anyway, so shouldn't have to do that. But anyway, he checks the super high-tech computers that clearly explain that the Fisher Price preventers just wouldn't cut it, and working models are three months out. Wouldn't you know it, though, they remember to set an arbitrary alert in case anyone accessed that one file for no apparent reason. I'd like to be the first to volunteer to take care of that problem as well. I suggest you take care of the Hugh Palmer problem first, Mr. Magruder. He's the immediate threat. Threat how, exactly? He's an old guy you're using as a scapegoat for the last rig explosion. What's he gonna do, throw his dentures at you? But he's busy copying files, which is called downloading on his computer for some reason, and deleting them. Because he's got some important data? It was never elaborated on. The important stuff was what Seagal could find, which he did. I thought Hugh didn't have clearance. Anyway, Jennings' henchman, Magruder, shows up, and we get a good look at him so I can tell you that, yes, that is John McGinley, who also played Dr. Perry Cox on Scrubs. I am, however, going to have to ask you for your pipe tally books, Hugh. His pipe tally books? Uh, well, first of all, they're on his computer, so that's a spreadsheet, not a pipe tally book. Second, how the fuck are records that show how deeply they've drilled remotely incriminating? When the fuck did this become important information? How the hell did he know that Dr. Cox was going to come looking to kill him? As he doesn't make with it, the good doctor checks his computer, but it's been replaced by a shitty animation. Your computer's been downloaded, Hugh. I'm afraid that's a problem. I know this movie is from 1994, but for fuck's sake, why does nobody know what the hell a download is? And I want those books. I'm telling you, I don't have them! Have you listened to yourself lately? Have you? Everything with you is I, I, I. There is no I in team. It is T-E-A-M. Team. Where the fuck did that come from? They continue torturing him while trying to find the discs, but after about 15 seconds of this, they just kill him and trash the place, managing to ensure they never find the completely mundane data that has no bearing on anything. 
After Michael establishes he's a heartless, money-grabbing bastard who doesn't care about the environment, again, Seagal tells him about the data that he looked up, and he knows that the Aegis One rig will likely blow up when it's switched on, making the alert informing him of that earlier completely pointless. How much is enough? How much money is enough? Well, considering the oil companies get government subsidies totaling at least $14 billion a year, I could see that it's probably not an easy industry to make money in. I mean, you gotta pay to clean up those spills and get sued whenever someone else complains that another species went extinct. See, there's a lot of hidden fees there. But after a minor transition, he's back again, and there's another accident that he needs Seagal to take care of. He goes along unquestioningly, which seems to imply he doesn't mind them blowing shit up and destroying the environment. They don't realize that, as it turns out this is just an elaborate attempt to kill him! Am I supposed to be remotely worried that he might have died? Or even got hurt? Oh wait, the movie's gone widescreen! We've reached an important part as Eskimos discover Seagal and mistakenly think he requires their help. Taking him back to their village, it looks like for once, Seagal's superpowers won't come from an oriental source. We also get a good look at the woman and therefore love interest, Masu the Eskimo, played by Joan Chen, who is Chinese. <laughs> Healing his wounds with a little Mrs. Dash and a big-ass knife, Seagal ends up going on a spiritual journey to find his way. They start this by lecturing to him about the mystical creation of life, where a man is made on the fifth day and everything else is made after him, by a raven who just so happened to have already been there and could talk. But Raven was worried the man would destroy everything he had made to inhabit the earth. So he formed Bear to be feared by man. But Bear was lazy and spent all his time eating seals and going fishing. Enough of this, though. It's time for the drug trip. You have died twice. Now sleep and be reborn. Uh, quick question. Uh, when was the second time? You will fight your most difficult battle. Then you will find your way back. That, uh, it, that's not how drug trip spiritual journeys work. Never mind that, it's time to explore Seagal's mind, which, strangely enough, is full of topless women. It is then he must make a choice. Considering there was no build-up to this, I think the choice is pretty obvious. But no, of course he has to pick the old woman, who makes this movie jump between widescreen and full screen with her subtitles, giving the obvious Save the Earth lip service, leading to the more obvious Water into Oil trick, where we find out that while he was out, evidently Seagal was chucked into a river for shits and giggles. Look out, though! The evil oil men have arrived at the village in their fancy flying machine, because they just figured out since they couldn't find Seagal's body, he's probably still alive. You may wonder how they managed to track him to the village so quickly. They didn't. It just so happens to be the first place they stopped to check. <sighs> they find the first piece of the trail there, and are sure to shoot the chief before they leave. Hey, wait a minute. Where the fuck is Seagal? The chief and his daughter brought him all the way out into a grassy clearing. What, did they just leave him there and hurry back so they don't miss the scene? I guess so, as Seagal makes it back alone, just after the oil men leave, and in time to be there for chief... Uh... Um, what the fuck's his name? Uh, oh... Saluk, played by Chief Irvin Brink. Saluk. What was the Eskimo's name not Eskimo enough for your movie? Anyway, while he's saying his last words in an uptitude, the Chinese lady is kind enough to translate them for the audience. This special amulet will help guide you in and out of the spirit world. Oh, oh don't, don't mind me. Please continue. One last widescreen shot before he dies and... Well, that's enough of this tribal bullshit slowing down the movie. If you think that's something, you should see Tech and Absolute's stash of PlayStation games. They reach Hugh's old place, which Dr. Cox completely ransacked, except, of course, for the closet where Seagal stashed some gear earlier. Oh, it was established earlier in the movie, in one line of dialogue, that was completely out of place, and made no sense. And wouldn't you know it... You. That's where he downloaded his computer to. A floppy disk! If he could do that, why even have a hard drive? After Seagal recovers his leather jacket and Masu slips into those tight-fitting lady jeans that Hugh had kicking around for some reason, 
The evil oil thugs arrive. A firefight breaks out, but considering the place is already trashed, it's kind of like watching somebody run over an Xbox 360 after it's already red-ringed. Anyway, now as we're an hour into the movie, it's time for random character development for Seagal. Try to imagine the ultimate fucking nightmare. And that won't come close to this son of a bitch when he gets pissed. I don't know. I've seen Seagal drunk. It's not that bad. Dr. Cox has an idea how to deal with him, though. What about independent contractors? I know of a group based out of New Orleans. Independent contractors? You mean mercenaries? So if your small army can't do the job, just get another army on top of it. One of their bullets is bound to hit. Mr. Jennings, I'm stoned. Were you able to get the files I requested? Ronald Lee, Ermey, what the hell are you... Are any of these skilled actors doing in this thing? After he establishes he's an evil, evil greedy man, yet again, we move on to John Trudel, the friend of Zagal's, apparently. Never heard about him before, but he's got a computer, so that's good enough. They find out that Aegis Oil has been pumping toxins right back into the wells after they tap all the oil because they're evil and hate the Earth like that. This is just one of the many little activities that Jennings uses to finance Aegis One and the rest of his dog shit empire. Who's giving them financial bonuses for this? And you're contradicting yourself. Later in the movie, you say that they just dump everything out in the ocean because the fines are too small to deter it. Seagal concludes that they must go to Aegis I and blow it up, so they therefore can avoid an ecological disaster. Wait, how the hell would that... Fuck it, it's Seagal logic. Have you learned anything from my father? What do you want me to learn, Masu? Huh? I mean, do you really think that this hocus pocus spirit stuff is gonna help us now. And there you have it! Her father died for nothing. Seriously, he doesn't give a rat's ass about the spirit journey and we never see the amulet again. He might have just thrown it away. I didn't want to resort to violence. I don't have a choice. You directed this, Seagal! As such, of course, there's a handy-dandy World War III starter kit in the other room and they're off to the secret mountain hideaway where he kept everything else that just didn't fit in the walk-in closet. Well, considering he's just taking a backpack full, though, it probably could have fit back at the other place with random friend who we'll never see again. He uses the rest to set the place to blow, so the mercenary helicopter following him crumples like a cheap model in the blast. Unfortunately for him, most of the mercs had already taken the horses at this time. However, he knows this and sets a bunch of traps to take a couple more out in the woods, allowing him the chance to escape. Good. At least we know where in the hell he's going to now, no. don't we, Mac? Damn right. They just won. When was this even a question? Seriously, you didn't know that... How the... Seagal's already there and shows the audience that he knows how to MacGyver a silencer, so nobody will hear this gunshot in this room full of loud machinery. It's then a series of scenes with Seagal booby-trapping sections of the refinery, blowing everything up and pouring toxins into the air. In the name of the ecosystem! My guy in D.C. tells me that we are not dealing with the student here, we're dealing with the professor. Anytime the military has an operation that can't fail, they call this guy in to train the troops, okay? He's the kind of guy that would drink a gallon of gasoline so he could piss in your campfire. Jennings already gave the Seagal ego trip speech of this movie. You don't need any more. The henchmen make a run for it, but Seagal isn't one to allow violence not to happen at any given time. Uh, listen to me! If you really want Jennings, you're gonna need me! I got files, I got tapes, I got books... Fair enough, you could shut down this whole operation and take a stand for the environment without resorting to violence. Ah! Or you can be a short-sighted sadistic asshole. Your choice. The PR lady, however, is a victim of her own stupidity. But since it's Seagal directing, I think it still technically counts as him killing her. Billy Bob Thornton also steps in for a few lines. Because when it's out, I kind of feel like a pussy, you know what I'm saying? And when it's in, it, it, it feels like, I don't know, meaner or something. And when I kill this so much, I won't feel good about myself. I won't feel solid. Seriously, Billy Bob Thornton. Why the fuck did so many actors with careers agree to do a Seagal film? Unfortunately, though, he is killed off with a Claymore mine. Seagal is then free to set the specific sequence to... Uh, or he can just smack the fuck out of every button and knob, hoping it causes the rig to fail. Now it's on to the drill. But, uh-oh. Alright, I'm 
to set some charges here which will cause the preventer to implode, and that'll prevent an oil spill. You're set... You're setting C4 to implode. What fucking technological powers did you pick up, Seagal? And no, this line did not save you from the fact that in this film, all of your actions are anything but eco-friendly. Look out, Stone is there. Shotgun and lower body covered in oil. If you do shoot him, you're going to ignite. Unless you're Seagal, of course. Jennings is nothing if not over-the-top cartoony stupid super evil villain, though, and is at the rig itself setting it to begin operations, because, of course, CEOs know how to do these things. He's still getting it online. That stupid asshole. Can't believe what he's doing, all right? Lose your gear, we're out of here, let's go. We got less than three minutes before this whole fucking place blows. Less than three? Seagal, your bomb was set for ten minutes. That's more than three. There he is! Don't shoot! Hold your fire! You'll blow us all the kingdom come in this room! Well, not according to 20 seconds ago! He kills everyone without breaking a sweat and catches up with Jennings. After pretending to be profound and emotional for a second, he simply hangs him by his ankle just so he can drop him down to die in the oil he lived by. Which finalizes that, no, Jennings did not experience any character development whatsoever during the entire movie, despite being the second largest role. Now they flee the exploding, uh, I mean, imploding oil rig that seems to implode outward in flames, but never mind pesky details like that. Now that the ecosystem is fucked for at least a few decades, we teleport to Seagal giving the big ending speech. It's nothing but a long lecture about how evil oil companies are and how fucked the planet is because of our prioritizing money before all else. Honestly, I share most of these views, spare some of the things that really come off like conspiracy theories, but the biggest problem with this scene is that he gives no data to back up his claims. All points are asserted without evidence, and therefore it means nothing to people who don't already agree with it. But who needs things like facts and figures when you can just show your audience images of dead animals covered in oil to scare them into believing you? <sighs> Well, that was on deadly ground, and I'm glad Seagal has never directed anything else. Save the Earth scripts are inherently preachy, and that generally doesn't work very well to keep it entertaining, but when you put together a movie trying to take a stand about big bad oil and the destruction of the environment, it might help your credence if you don't spend the entire film polluting the fuck out of your location. Also, when nature steps in and gives you the power to fight against evil forces with earth magic, why make that scene pointless by tossing it aside? Yeah, I know if we want to do anything, we have to do it ourselves, but why piss on spirituality to prove that point? Just do it yourself from the start. Seagal gives an average performance here. He does show the earliest hints of emotion in some scenes, but mostly he's just him for the umpteenth time. One thing that is surprising, though, is the supporting cast. So many big names everywhere in this movie. I'm thinking that's where this movie's alleged $50 million budget went, and that part of it was well spent. Despite the characters being stereotypical, shallow, ridiculous excuses for human beings, the acting was very damn good. I especially liked Michael Caine as Jennings. His character had to be the stupidest excuse for an action movie villain I've seen in a long time, but Caine's performance was brilliant. He's so over-the-top and vicious, I just loved every scene he was in. Overall, On Deadly Ground is crap. It talks down to the audience about environmentalism while ignoring the message it's trying to push, and the plot is barely held together against all the ridiculous shit that happens in this movie. However, the supporting roles are done very well, and at times it honestly can entertain, barely coming in at two polar bears out of five. Seagal, you really should just leave environmentalism to scientists who have spent their lives and careers studying and understanding it. And you should leave sensationalism that puts the cause back several decades to Al Gore. Just saying. Thank you all for watching, I'm Decker Shadow, and remember, the Earth is fine. It's the human race that's fucked.
Jesus Christ, this motherfucker's good. I told you he's good, didn't I? Yeah, he's good, and he's coming this way. 